Hi everybody, Paul Cameron here from speedupmyjobsearch.com with a clip from our monthly jobs driven networking group which meets in Wheaton, Illinois every third Thursday. Let's take a look. Megan is, and you've got an amazingly long list of things that you have done. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> MS, CRC, LCPC, which just basically means she knows a lot more about this than we do. Uh, the reason I met Megan in the first place is because Jim Fergal uh, had uh, made that recommendation that we, uh, that we talk. And he's a, obviously a champion of all things job search and said that she would do a wonderful job and was nice enough to allow me to come out and, and talk to your group about LinkedIn and things. And I'm very just happy to have you here. So I'm going to get out of your way and let you talk. Welcome. Thanks everyone for giving me a little bit of your time. So we're going to talk a little bit about navigating some unique barriers and challenges that can come up that might have to do with having a disability or employment gaps. Um, and this is kind of a lot of what we see. So I work with, again, veterans who have all sorts of different uh, disabilities and other barriers to employment. So this is kind of the bread and butter of what we do at the VA hospital. So with disability, we're going to talk a little bit about some resources what are the protections, disclosure, if you should, how and when to do that with an employer, accommodations, when to make those requests. We'll talk about employment gaps and then legal history. How do we address that both on paper, in an application, interviewing and networking. One in five individuals in the United States does live with a disability. The number of working age people who are disabled is about 32 million. Seven out of 10 people with disabilities who are not working would like to work and seek employment. And the most important statistic and why I even bring this up is because of this last point here. Even if we don't self-identify as a person with a disability, it's actually the largest and most fast growing group of minority groups that will inevitably potentially affect all of us at some point. So just kind of knowing your resources, ADA, they do have five titles that offer various different protections against discrimination. One of their titles specifically addresses protects against discrimination with employment, recruiting, training, pay, benefits, hiring, layoffs, all that stuff. They are specific to people who meet the definition of a person with a disability. So ADA defines that as someone with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, and you have to have some kind of record with disability, which just means you have gone to a doctor for some kind of treatment, there's some kind of formal diagnosis of whatever condition that you have. Just because we have a disability doesn't mean that we don't have to meet the qualifications for a job. You still have to meet all the qualifications and be able to perform it with or without an accommodation. An accommodation is anything that helps you apply for a job. So if you're visually impaired or hard of hearing and you're going to an interview, or if your interview process involves needing to take some type of assessment and you need longer test taking time. So anything that allows you to apply for a job, perform the duties of your job, or just enjoy any of the basic privileges that all the staff enjoy, that would be an accommodation. What can an employer ask? So if you choose to disclose your disability, you can choose to do so at the interview, the job offer, or on the job. If you're on the job, it's up to you to decide, do I say something when I start to have some difficulties or I realize I might need an accommodation? You'll need to kind of navigate when and how to disclose. It's a common misconception that an employer can never ask you if you have a disability. I mean, they can't point blank come out and ask you, but they can ask if you've requested an accommodation at any point or if your disability is obvious. They can ask you if you can do the functions of your job given your disability. They can ask you to demonstrate how you would do the job with or without an accommodation. They can inquire about your ability to perform different functions. But that's, that's pretty much where that ends. If you request an accommodation, they're always going to ask for medical documentation. They cannot ask for any pre-employment inquiries about the nature or the severity of your disability. You know, when did you, when was the onset? They can't ask about any of that. And they can require a post-offer medical exam, but only if it's required by all of the applicants. So they can't, nothing that is just specific to you. 
If you're kind of trying to figure out whether or not to disclose at the point of an interview, you might want to just consider, you know, what is the interview process? Ask the employer. Say, hey, you know, is there an assessment that's involved in this? Or if you have mobility issues or you use a wheelchair, you know, asking if this is a, um, you know, accessible facility, things like that. Just kind of know a little bit more information going into the interview. So you don't have to disclose, that's always an option. But if you are going to disclose, you kind of need to think about like symptoms versus a diagnosis, you know? You don't have to divulge everything about whatever your condition is. You kind of just need to think about what are the job-related implications? What are the potential benefits? that how is this going to help me to do my job any better. If you need to stand up and walk because you deal with chronic pain, do you feel like you would kind of want to just talk to your supervisor about that? Sometimes you don't need to do a formal accommodation if you have a nice supervisor, you know, who's reasonable. Obviously, you can just have these conversations and sometimes the supervisor will just say, well, okay, fine, I'm okay with this, you know, we, can, we don't need to do like a formal accommodation. And thinking about your essential versus your marginal function. So this becomes important if you're talking about requesting any accommodation. So your fun essential functions are like the fundamental job duties that you have to do. The marginal functions are kind of the way you complete a task. So for example, my job requires that I document notes every time I have a patient appointment or any kind of interaction with a patient. That is an essential function of my job. I need to document notes. It is not an essential function that I type those notes into the computer. So if I'm visually impaired, I can use JAWS software, magnifying software, or I even can use a workplace assistant to type my notes in for me. So that's a marginal function. You have to ask yourself, what is the goal? I think that's ultimately the question you want to ask. If I, just, if I choose to disclose, what is ultimately the goal of disclosing? Now that's going to be a different answer for everybody. So. Yeah. Now, do you have any advice on indirect uh, accommodations, you know, like extra help? Have you heard of the Job Accommodation Network, the JAN Network? That is our go-to website for accommodations. So you can search on there accommodations by disability. You can search by symptom. And so given that a lot, most of the veterans I work with have more invisible disabilities, it's, you know, sleep apnea related or it's mental health related or it's cognitive, it's ADD, uh, what sort of accommodations we can use. I've had folks who have done flex uh, scheduling, especially when sleep is an issue, having just a later start time or, you know, allowing for grace period to come into work at a certain time, you know, noise canceling headphones for ADD. But check out the JAN network because when in doubt, I use the JAN network for every time I'm doing it, helping someone do an accommodation. But with legal history, just a couple things to consider. It does it, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the processes of sealing versus expunging records. Key difference is sealing. Your record still exists in a legal and physical sense. Um, it hides your record from the general public, but like hospitals, schools, law enforcement can still see that. Expungement is an actual, like your record is deleted. Certain arrests can still come up. Certain convictions are not allowed to be sealed or expunged. Violent offenses across the board are not allowed to be sealed or expunged. Arrests show up on a background check even if there is no conviction. I always suggest, you know, targeting employers that market themselves as open to hiring people with felonies or have what's called second chance programs. Paul mentioned, I, so I have a bean, right? I yeah, I have a bean. You know, they have uh, branded, marketed themselves as a second chance program. Felony Franks, you brought up. There are companies out there. If you were to Google search, there is a laundry list of employers that um, put themselves out there as felony friendly companies. In the please explain, every application, you check the box and then they say, here's, here's 200 characters to explain exactly what you did and why and how long ago. I always say only tell the most basic information. Put a positive spin on things. What have you been doing to improve? What sort of changes have you made? Did you have a rough patch in your life? Have you sought treatment? Was it a drug-related offense? And those types of things. Talk about what you've done. Since then, I have aggressively engaged in treatment programs for mental health or for addiction. I have been sober and clean for 20 years, you know, maybe my violent offense was 30 years ago or whatever the case. 
as a personal caretaker, you actually can get compensated from the state for that, right? So technically, I've used that as self-employed. I've put personal caretaker on a resume and I've put self-employed. How do you get compensated for that? I think it's through the Department of Aging, I think. I have to double check, but I'll, I think Department of Aging compensates caretakers up to eight, 900 bucks a month, maybe. And employers want to know that you want to learn about that, right? Because the more that you're interested in that and the more that you appreciate working for a company, the more you're likely it is that you're going to stay there. You know, and that's kind of what they care about. So make sure you're asking information about the job, about the culture, about how you can benefit them, what are their hiring needs, you know, what are where they have turnover the most, how can you be the asset, you know? What was your line, Patrick? To be interested, be to be interesting, be interested. There you exactly. Go. Yeah. That's a great one. I yeah. like that. These were the resources I mentioned. They're mostly disability focused, but this JAN network is the one I was mentioning. I use that as a regular part of my job. I hope that was helpful for you. And please check out the rest of our YouTube channel for more tips and strategies to help you with your job search. Just look for Speed Up My Job Search, all one word, or use the link on your screen now. Now, if you'd like to join us at our next meeting, just go to drivestaff.com slash JDNG for details. Each month, we cover a different aspect of networking to help you sharpen your networking skills and to help you build your network with the other attendees. Now, if the location or the time doesn't work for you, we do have an online version available as well, and you can still network with us in our online private member forum. I'd love to meet you at the next one, so I hope you can make it. Thanks for watching.